face to face. Is anybody else like that but me? I see a lot of heads nodding. Okay? I actually long for the embrace of my Lord and my Savior. The same way that one would long, oh, and actually probably much deeper than, one would long for the embrace of their spouse or the embrace of a child or the embrace of of a parent or an old friend. It's much deeper than that. I'm not one of these guys that tries to talk up the intimacy that we're supposed to have with God. I think some of that's going way overboard. It's sort of like making God a boyfriend here. And I don't think that's right. But I do believe it should be our desire when we're alone to want to be with Jesus. I want to be. I want to be with Him more than I want anything in this world. I want to be with Jesus. And God promises us a promise. Promises with God are never broken. And this promise is that one of these days Christ is going to appear in the clouds to do one thing. And that is to bring us to Him so that from that point forward we will never be away from Jesus. Somebody say amen. Never, never, ever will we ever feel like we're all alone. That's what I want. Amen? That's what I want more than anything in this life. And he says in verse 18, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I heard this, heard this preached and I like this. To put things in perspective for you, I want you to listen to this. Okay? How many of you believe hell is forever? Say amen. It's forever. You're not getting out. You won't be annihilated. One of the things, if I wanted to be a religion, I would be a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness say that if you're wicked and you die, that's it. That's it. You're in the grave for all of eternity. And you have no knowledge of anything whatsoever. And I'm going, hey, that's pretty cool. I can live like a dog. And when I die, it's over with. I don't see how you promise people eternal life like that. I'd rather have eternal death if that was the case. That's just how lazy I am. You promise me I can sleep forever? Yeah! Let's do it! What if, what if we believed that hell wasn't forever? That hell was a hundred years? You would die and you would go to hell for a hundred years. Now hell's hot. Excruciating pain for one hundred years. But at the end of that hundred years, Jody, you would be let out and enjoy eternal life in heaven forever. Well, let me let me just let me just give it to you like this. Let's say that we all had to do that in order to get to heaven. Okay? I mean, if I asked you right now, do you want to go to hell for all of eternity? You'd say no. 
If I were to ask you to say, what if it was only for a hundred years? And then you would enjoy all the blessings of eternal life forever and ever in, in absolute eternal bliss for all of eternity. It might handle the hundred years. Right? At least you would be getting out and had something to look forward to. Hope. Well, let me give it to you like this then. We don't have to go to hell to get to heaven. But we do have to live here to get there. And I'll be honest with you. I've been through some rough stuff in my life. I know some of you, you have too. This is not as bad as hell. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm glad that I have something better to look forward to. And I don't think I ought to complain as much as I do about what I do have to live with. Because God has promised me a much greater thing. I am going to get to live with Jesus and never be separated from Him for all of eternity. I am going to get to get that. And what did I do to deserve it? Nothing. I just believe that it's going to happen. Amen? And I believe in Jesus' saving grace. How many of you are excited about the rapture? Say amen. Could it happen tonight as far as you're concerned? What about what you got planned tomorrow? Huh? You forget it? I thought you were going to pump, pump iron this week. I thought you were going to work out, man. Who would get your truck? Paul. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Let's hope not. Let's hope Paul wouldn't get his truck. Amen, Paul? Yeah. I tell you what, I I I've I don't have any unbreakable plans when it comes to going to heaven. Amen. I don't have any unbreakable plans. I and to be honest with you. One of the things that God is desperately trying to do in His church is to start getting us to cut ties with this world. So that Remember that rope I used this morning? Tied to the Word of God? I think in doing that, we're going to have to cut ties with the world because we'll be pulled apart, won't we? The Bible's going one way, the world's going to another. We're going to have to start cutting the strings of this world, cutting the connections off, and start having your days filled with breakable plans just in case God decides to blow a trumpet. Amen? Just in case He does. Now this is one of the teachings that I'm going to do on this. Okay? The rest of them, I think, are going to be a little bit more technical. We're going to go through the Scriptures. We're going to see. I've got notes written here that I didn't get to about, about shouting. It says, The Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. You ought to see from the Bible what that's associated with, what's going to happen when that happens. You'll see it all through the Old Testament. You'll see it in the New Testament. Okay? And we'll actually look, we'll actually look at the testimony of people who were raptured. Okay? We're going to see their testimony. It's good to be with you tonight. Say amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I thank you, God. Lord, Father, for giving us this promise. We'll turn uh, once again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We talked uh, last Sunday night about the promise of the rapture. We, we call it that rap, We call it that title. We give it that name and some people trip over that because they say, I don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. And I, understand, and I didn't believe that for a while until I looked and I thought, well, it's not in there. The word rapture is not in the Bible. And uh, you'd be surprised some of the words that we use in Christianity uh, that we think is in the Bible is not in the Bible. How many have you ever heard of the phrase holy of holies before? Anybody ever heard of that? I, I, I looked all day for that one day. I looked all day long for that in the King James Bible and it's not in there. 
It's not, I thought it was. I mean, I, that's what it always heard, called Holy the Holies. And it's not in there. It is, called, it is referred to in the King James, the most holy place. Is what it's referred to. And, it's, and what that's talking about is that area of the tabernacle or the temple. That area there where the Ark of the Covenant was. And the high priest only was allowed to go in there one time a year on the Day of Atonement to offer the atonement for sins. That is where the presence of God was going to meet the high priest at. And what that is, that's a picture of heaven. Um, and and where, where God sits on the throne in heaven. But the, the phrase itself, Holy of Holies, I don't know who came up with that. And I'm not, I'm not knocking it, I'm just saying it's not in the Bible anywhere. Uh, it is referred to as the most holy place. Um, likewise, the word rapture is not in the scriptures anymore. There's other terms for it, uh, like translation, and we'll look at that word tonight. Uh, the, being the, the, the catching up, we will see that also in the scriptures as well. But the word rapture is a, is a term uh, that, has been, that has been used. It's a Latin word, uh, and, it's, and it's been used to describe this particular event, the catching away of, of the saints in the last days. But anyway, let's, we talked last Sunday night about the, the doctrinal statements that are made concerning the rapture. And we have two places. We have a witness. We have two witnesses in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and that's what we'll read. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we talked about that last Sunday night. Uh, so we have two witnesses in the Bible. Both are doctrinal statements by the Apostle Paul telling us that this event will take place. And when you read the language, there's no, there's no obscurity here. There's nothing that's real hard to figure out. He says very plainly what will happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord Himself, not one of His angels, not, not, not anything else, but the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So we see here, and here again, you're looking at this, and there's just, this is not, even, even though it's the King James, and people say, I can't understand the King James. How many of you understood this? I mean, this is pretty simple, isn't it? We see that the Lord Himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and they would, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. That's not difficult to understand. The problem is, when is this event going to occur? When is this going to happen? Now we know that the Bible tells us, and we might get into this later, we know the scripture tells us, we know that Jesus told us that no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Now I'm going to tell you something. God is not going to be made a liar out of. Amen? If Jesus said that no man knoweth the day nor the hour, I'm telling you that if somebody writes a book, puts out a video, gets on television saying they've got a revelation from God, saying that they know when it's going to take place, they are, it's not maybe, they are a false prophet and we're not required to listen to them. Amen? They've lied about it. Back in night to a year after I got married, 88 Reasons, a book was put out called 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 1988. So it had 88 little reasons there why this guy was saying it would return, he, Jesus would return in 1988. And I, I was listening to a guy talk about this and he said, here's the thing that troubles me. He said, this guy wrote this book and this was, this was 1987 I think. He said, here this guy wrote this book and he'll sell it to you for five dollars. Well, my thing is, if this guy knows that Jesus is coming next year in 1988, what does he need with my five dollars? Amen? The love of money is what? The root of all evil. Okay? This guy was making a buck. And when it didn't happen, by the way, it didn't happen. Okay? When it didn't happen, he wrote another one. 